Okay, so next we have uh, Issa Sigelnecki, who's going to be, uh, well, it's a bit of a link between this session and the session before, so she's going to be talking about uh, uh, malaria treatment, um, well, during the Ebola outbreak. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for giving me opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I would like to, uh, to share with you some interesting uh, and unexpected findings from one of our Ebola centers uh, that MSF uh, managed in, um, in Liberia. Uh, so despite this being the largest ever Ebola outbreak and lasting now for more than 15 months, we still have absolutely no evidence that any of the therapeutic interventions we are using makes any difference on patients' mortality. Uh, the treatment we are using today is still symptomatic and partially presumptive. So what part of this presumptive treatment is also systematic use of anti-malarial treatment that is either given systematically to all the patients at admission or based on the positive result of a malaria rapid test. In MSF, we prefer the first option, so to give uh, anti-malaria systematically to all the patients at admission, also with the intention to prevent malaria during the stay in the Ebola center. In MSF, the first choice, the preferred choice, is artemeter, the combination of artemeter and rumefantrin. Uh, so I will, uh, this, the data I'm presenting is coming from FOIA in Liberia. As you can see in the map uh, up, uh, the FOIA is uh, it's a, it's a town in northern Liberia bordering Guinea, and in fact, it's, a, it's just across the river from Gekedo where the outbreak first started. The outbreak in Foya started, the first cases were reported in March and April, and then after a little break, the epidemic really started in June 2014, and then the number of cases very rapidly increased in August. Uh, on the right side, you see the, uh, the treatment center, First, there was just an isolation unit in the big uh, building in the middle that was a former refugee transit unit that was set up to manage 10 to 20 patients. And then when the number of cases inside the center increased to more than 100, the center kind of mushroomed in a chaotic way around this uh, original center. So during this uh, very busy time of very fast uh, increase of uh, new admitted cases, the team experienced a shortage of first-line anti-malarial treatment. So during this time, the first-line treatment, artemeter lumefantrine, was replaced by another commonly used combination, artesanate amodeakin, for a period of 12 days. Artesanate amodeakin is also the first-line treatment in all three affected countries, including Liberia. Uh, it has been shown in, uh, uh, previously that amodeakin has some in vitro activity against the Ebola virus. And on the, uh, on the left side, there's just a picture that's a border crossing between Guinea and Liberia. And the team in FOIA was, for most of the time, uh, supplied from Gekedo uh, through this way. And also the sample, the blood sample, there was a laboratory that was based in Gekedo, so the blood samples traveled every day across the river. To the so that's just uh, another epidemiological curve showing you the confirmed and the number of admit new admitted patients per day. The confirmed cases are in red and the patients that show not to be Ebola cases in, in green. And in the shaded area, you have the period of time where the only uh, artesanate amodaikin <coughs> combination was used due to the shortage. So we use this unfortunate opportunity of uh, drug shortage to explore whether there is a difference in mortality between the patients that systematically received either artemeter lumefantrine or artesanant amodiakin. For this, we use the standardized line listing, uh, line list data of the patients, so very similar to what uh, Francesco used to uh, combined an ana analysis, but our data also included in this uh, simple epidemiological line list, there was also the, the epidemiologist took time to also enter the what type of treatment was prescribed. So there's just what the information we have is only about the treatment prescribed at the, to the patients then. Uh, so if we look at the patient characteristics, so the patients receiving uh, either of an anti-malaria combinations or those who were not prescribed any anti-malaria treatment were very similar in their baseline characteristics. However, the patients in the group of artesanate amodic and those that were not prescribed any anti-malaria treatment had a slightly lower CT value at admission 
So that means higher viral load at admission. And in particular, patients in the artisan at Amodaikin group, they were admitting during the particularly busy period. So there were an average 100 patients admitted in the center during that time, compared to around 50 in the other two groups. And then we also, the, the last important difference is in cases coming per unique home village in particular groups. So in fact, we tried to look at the, if there is a difference in mortality, because it could also be linked to the, the fact that a lot of patients would be coming from the same big families and there'd be uh, genetically maybe a bit different and have different risk of dying. And we see that the patients in uh, Artemeter lumefantrin group were more likely to come from the same village compared to the other two groups. Uh, so the patients that were prescribed Artemeter lumefantrin had an overall mortality to 65%, very similar to those patients that were not prescribed any anti-malarial treatment. Our patients in the artesan at Amodiakin group had 50% mortality. The risk ratio of dying for patients that prescribed amodiakin artesanate compared to the artemeter lumefantrin was 21% lower in unadjusted analysis and 31% 31, 31 lower in adjusted analysis. So in adjusted analysis, we looked for different risk factors that were associated with mortality, so very similar to the previous uh, Previous analysis, those patients that were older were had a higher risk of dying, and particularly the, the strongest predictor of death is the cycle threshold at admission. We also looked at the patients that were receiving or were prescribed IV fluids, and those had a higher risk of dying. That is probably just a, a proxy uh, indicator for those patients that were more severely sick. That's why they were prescribed the treatment. And then the number of patients that were present at the day the person, the patient was admitted as a little bit of a proxy of quality of care that was provided. So patients that were admitted at the busiest time were also more likely to die. Then we did some sub-analysis. And so we thought maybe this uh, effect that we are seeing of uh, artesanate amodiakin on uh, mortality, it might be just due to the patients having malaria and they uh, they have higher chances because they, we treat their malaria. However, when we look at the subgroup of patients that had the RDT positive, uh, so the rapid test confirmed malaria, this effect of uh, there's no more difference between patients receiving either anti-malaria treatment. However, the effect is stronger in the patients that had no, that didn't have malaria at admission. We also looked at the patients uh, uh, that had a higher or lower viral load at admission, because that's been a little bit uh, directed in other uh, treatment studies ongoing. The, so patients that had a lower viral load at admission, so higher CT values, uh, the effect was of ammonia kinartesonate was much stronger compared to the patients that uh, arrived with the high viral load at admission. So what we show in our analysis, in the, what we observed in our group of patients, that uh, those patients that were prescribed Amodia kinartesonate had the higher chances of surviving. This study had, has many big limitations. First of all, it's observational study. Uh, the only data we have is the data on what was prescribed. We have no idea which patients actually took treatment or not. So this is both anti-malaria treatments that were prescribed are oral medications, so the patients that are already sick and have nausea and vomiting might have difficulties taking the treatment. And in the particular, amodiakin is associated or is perceived to be associated with more side effects uh, like uh, nausea and vomiting. So it might be even more likely that patients prescribed artesanate amodiakin didn't take it. Uh, the quality of data we have, it's, it's limited by the conditions in the field, so it was collected at a very busy times. And yeah, we have a number of patients that were not prescribed anti any anti-malarial treatment and they were actually not really able to explain why did this happened. For some patients, probably because they had negative results and the team decided not to give treatment or because they were rationing uh, artemeter uh, lumefantrin doses when the shortage was uh, foreseen. There might be other confounding factors that we did not think about and we could not control for. 
and it's the, it's the sample size, the number of patients we had was rather small. There is an alternative hypothesis to amodiakin having a positive effect on the survival, is that the combination of artemetal lumefantrin might be harmful uh, for the Ebola-infected patients. There is some rationale on it because lumefantrin is a, a drug slightly similar to the halofantrin that has been very much associated with the sudden deaths linked with the QT prolongation that might be more, um, especially in patients that have hypokalemia or hypognosemia, which can be the case potentially in the Ebola-affected patients, so it might, there might be a link to that as well. Then. So what to do with this uh, information? So within the, the discussions we had within MSF and with the uh, malaria working group is that there, it might be wise to change the first line anti-malaria treatment at least uh, for our patients since the both drugs are similarly effective and it seems that the, there might be potential benefit of uh, the combination of artisan and amodiakin. We absolutely need more data to confirm this uh, uh, findings and to try to understand uh, how the drug, if at all, works, how this could be done. So I think the first thing would be to look at any possible data that exists on the uh, use of artisanate amodiakin in those countries. Unfortunately, it seems that the majority of the centers, not just MSF, but also all the other centers, prefer to use the combination of uh, artemetal lumefantrin or just injectable artisanate. And the other option might be to try to see something into this uh, mass distribution of anti-malaria that were described earlier. And then in, in, uh, in parallel, the, there should be preclinical studies both in vitro and, and animals to confirm the mechanisms of action and to, to try to, to see if the drugs actually works and how would that happen. And this is uh, planned and will hopefully start soon. Then. So I would like to thank everyone in the, in the field for collecting the data, the Ministry of Health, to all the people who contributed to discussions and brainstorming <laughs> around this analysis, uh, and to all the patients and population in FOIA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isis. So I think we have time for a couple of very quick questions. Um, well, we don't really have time, but we're going to have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at the back there, yeah. or at, at the side. Thanks. Is that, is that, this uh, is Tria Lazarus from MSF. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you know if the drugs were given to the patient for them to take, or if the, or if they were given uh, on a daily basis? Because in some of the centers, were, the bag was just given to the patient upon arrival. Yeah. So the, here, the, the for the. As it might have changed at the very end, where the numbers went down, but for the most of the time, the treatment, the presumptive systematic treatment was prescribed at admission, and the treatment was prepackaged for patients, and it was up to them to take it. So we have absolutely no idea if they actually took the treatment or not. Any others? If not, we'll thank Isra again for a fascinating trip.